Welcome back, Peak Performance uh, Training Group. Uh, I am happy to deliver my first podcast this year. Um, I have been working on this uh, presentation for quite some time. Uh, I'm actually going to be presenting in Northeast Ohio at the NSCA clinic on this subject, and I wanted to preemptively share this with the group. Uh, some of the listeners out there already have know or experienced my background. Um, I've been a personal trainer for 12 years, strength and conditioning coach, uh, speed agility quickness uh, specialist. I've worked in many different areas uh, from uh, the manufacturing side currently to uh, business operations. Uh, through those, uh, through that time, I've actually had the opportunity of getting uh, my hands on some of the t neatest pieces of equipment and being exposed to some of the best environments from a training perspective. Uh, from a training perspective. So today's presentation is about talking about uh, using technology to bridge the gap to improve fitness and athletic uh, development. So um, I'm really, really happy to get this kicked off. And uh, what I want to talk about are three specific questions. Um, these three specific questions are, um, can we use technology to get the greatest possible significance in the least amount of time? Uh, and the biggest thing that we're having, to, the, the challenges that we're having today as fitness professionals, as coaches, is that we have very little time because of either rules and regulations within season or because of active daily living. Uh, people that work uh, behind desks all day don't have time to work out. That's the commonly used excuse. So how do we use technology to make it very meaningful? Um, and what are these KPIs, key performance indicators? So when we talk about that, we're going to talk about training load. We're going to talk about preparedness, readiness. We're going to talk about uh, indicators of intensity. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, uh, do you collect information? And if you don't, shame on you. Uh, that's the most important thing to really gather at, because when we're working either one-on-one -on -one or working when we're working with a, work, a group, um, we should have meaningful information to document how we can get better or was that a mistake? Because, you know, in my short period of time, I've made many mistakes, but I've also had the benefit of working with a lot of different professionals out there that have shared with me what they've learned, the mistakes that they've made. So this presentation is kind of is a compilation of uh, a thought process, and, and that thought process really uh, talks about um, specific common fitness goals that we see in the industry from any um, from a broad perspective. Um, there's people that want to improve their work. There's people that want to improve uh, their life. Um, there's people that want to improve their performance in sports. Um, people that just want to maybe lower their blood sugar level or control their cardiovascular disease, um, reduce mental anxiety, weight management. Um, so one of these are the four of these types of goals are the common goals that we keep hearing from all walks of life. The philosophical uh, conversation that I think I'm going to have here, and it is, everyone has their own personal philosophy, and I encourage you guys to define that, but we'll also have to have some evidence behind it. And that's a common uh, uh, term used today. Evidence-based uh, decision-making or evidence-based practice is actually something that's been adopted from the medical industry when uh, we uh, look at their way of coming to a, a medical diagnosis. They use this kind of philosophy, and I've adapted it for a coach, for a trainer, uh, or just for an individual. we got to look at their practice. What are they doing? Their workouts. Uh, we've got to look at the game, um, in other words, their competition or the event that they're training for. Um, we've got to look at what the research tells us. And we've got to see, is that research valid? Um, we've got to look at our own personal experience and the experience of the individual we're working with, the level of fitness of the individual. Um, are they qualified to move? Uh, or do we know that they, could, they have the good movement skills to do a certain a specific exercise. And last but not least, the feedback of the individual. If the individual tells you they hate doing something, you're not going to motivate them to make a lifestyle change if you continuously uh, do make them do something they don't like. So you have to have a, a definition of these. Each individual does it by nature, but you got to have this framework. So I mentioned key performance indicators before, and we're talking about metabolic training. So when we talk about metabolic training, we're going to talk about the heart. Uh, we're going to talk about the nervous system, uh, and we're going to talk about energy systems. 
So if we look at the, the images on the screen right now, we look at the heart as this four chamber muscle that has this, auto, uh, this automatic uh, nervous system uh, that creates a waveform that's one of the most commonly studied waveforms uh, in, as far as measuring bio potentials of the human body for feedback. And that's called the QRS waveform. And in that QRS waveform, which is right on your screen there, those peaks are R waves. So from peak to peak, it's called R to R measurement. That R to R measurement is measured sometimes over a period of time, for example, a minute, and we get heart rate. Um, the other measurement that we get from that is measuring the speed and distance and measure the variability there. It's called heart rate variability. Um, that's automatic. That your brain and uh, your autonomic nervous system manages for us. Uh, by measuring those things, they are great biomarkers to indicate if you're prepared, if you're ready, what intensities you should be training at. Uh, they're also good for medical uh, applications. Uh, if we see an abnormal QRS waveform, then a medical professional could t indicate to you what part of the heart you have a problem with, what potential disease you might have. So we're going to look at the metabolic system through indicators. And heart rate, heart rate variability, heart rate recovery will be one of those. <clears throat> the next thing is metabolic has a relationship uh, between energy systems used. Traditionally, it's been linear, so most people always look at from uh, the, uh, the x-axis here based on time. So going across the screen, we have time from 0 to 30 seconds of activity at a high intensity, if you look at the top, between 189 to 89% is typically lactate or A-lactate work. And then uh, it's been looked at the next after 30 seconds, this magic window, which I'm going to address, they call it the anaerobic glycolysis, so from 30 to 120 seconds. And then we have 120 to 150 seconds, or, uh, excuse me, yeah, uh, actually uh, to 120 seconds. It should be 20, once you get to three minutes or greater, 120 seconds or beyond that, it's considered the oxidative system, because by that time, your body's able to use and break down fat as an energy source. Within each energy system, between ATP and the anaerobic glycolysis, typically we have fast twitch muscle fibers type A and type 2B involved. And then we have the type 1 muscle fibers in the oxidative system. And we usually think it's a linear relationship. In, in actuality, it's not a linear relationship. All these energy systems are responsible to develop ATP PC. Some do it better than others, but they are usually, it's usually by time, it's indicated by time and by intensity. And then uh, by the intensity, we know that one energy system might be dominant, but the other energy systems are still working to contribute their fair share to ATP to, to develop more ATP. So don't look at this linearly. I encourage you guys to look at it like in a, in a circular format. So that being said, um, we're going to then apply this example of intensity from that 100% all the way to 61 to track and field events. And this is a graph that represents uh, the track and field of world records. Um, so here we have for the 100 meter that was done at 9.85, uh, uh, 9 seconds and 58 millisec uh, milliseconds was the greatest, uh, was the, the world record for the 100 meter um, to the, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the y-axis there is mill is uh, milliseconds per, per second. Um, if we break down that time and divide it by uh, the distance, we get 10, uh, 10 meters per second that uh, Usain Bolt was able to cover. That's uh, a muscle fiber type, very explosive. So as we notice here, as we go down by world record by world record, we see that the meters per second slow down. So there's a relationship between types of activities and types of physiological response. So the key thing when you look at energy systems, it's not just fuel alone, it's type of muscle fiber as well. So uh, this is a great chart that kind of shows you the activity and, and shows you that it's not just, metabolics is not separate from muscle fiber. When we talk about metabolics, it should be it should be everything. So 
where do we start? Well, first of all, we need to test something. Uh, there's many different types of tools for testing. Um, we can test VO2 max. We can test critical velocity. We can test how fast they recover, can recover with many different types of devices. Um, the first device I'm going to show you is an Omega Wave ECG sensor, which is a simple transmitter belt and a simple uh, puck and ECG sensor. Uh, and then we have a bio harness, which is a physiological sensor that has uh, five different pieces of technology built into this uh, strap. Uh, and then I'm also going to show you an accelerometer, which is uh, going to measure uh, the uh, stiffness of the muscle. So what are we going to test? I'm going to give you a couple of recommendations based on what I've seen in the industry from the uh, really successful instructors to the successful professional coaches. So uh, before we talk about types of tests, we're going to talk about the most commonly tested test. And VO2 max is the most commonly uh, tested test. Um, in simple, in a simple way to describe it is, I always tell people is, what size engine you got? Do you got a lawnmower or do you got a semi truck? Uh, looking at the evidence again, um, this is a very fixed, uh, physiological, genetically based type of um, uh, measurement. Uh, what I mean by that is that we can you have a very small window. Uh, a very small change uh, uh, that you can make on this because we can't change the size of the lung, we can't change the size of the heart. However, we could make an impact by this or we could have a better understanding of what type of individual we're dealing with, right? Are you a four, do you have a four cylinder, six cylinder, or, or eight cylinder vehicle? Um, we need to know that information, so we gotta measure it. Typically, it's measured by a ramped effort test or a time test that we know the specific distance and we could apply specific algorithms out there. Um, many algorithms that have been applied or have been developed by the American College of Sports Medicine, um, specific researchers. Uh, typically, I use a bulky protocol or a modified goose protocol, uh, standard uh, rate, uh, uh, ramped effort test on a treadmill. Uh, the other measurement that, that I'm going to talk about that I think is trainable is um, the not only not the size, per gallon, per, per the size of the engine, but how many miles per gallon do I get on there before I, I start getting in a red and start heating up that vehicle? And that's the anaerobic threshold. Uh, the anaerobic threshold for us is something that's trainable, right? Uh, it, it's represented in these two curves here. The red curve is the pretest where you see it's to the left of, of, of the, of the uh, blue curve. And if we train the body, to be able to tolerate and buffer and use lactic acid and use anaerobic uh, sources of energy more efficiently, we could make them work harder for a longer period of time or, uh, before they start getting into that red where they need to do more recovery or they need to slow down or stop. So um, that's trainable. So we could enhance the engine to be more efficient miles per gallon. It might be a 12 liter vehicle or a 13 liter vehicle but I can get a lot of miles per gallon for it. And that's really what's the most trainable. Uh, so percent of AT uh, typically measured by heart rate. Uh, and we're going to talk about some methods that we could use to test. Uh, the, the, the method or the golden standard is a, a physiological test for uh, mask testing. That mask testing measures RER. And we're going to talk about a study in a little while looking at uh, the equivalent that a person is inspiring and expiring, uh, and that ratio is carbon dioxide uh, to oxygen. It typically shows us if there's a uh, that if there's more uh, if there is uh, more oxygen being burned or consumed and efficiently used, the person is efficiently still using fat as an energy source. But as they start uh, having a one-to-one -one ratio, we notice that they are actually burning more sugar than fat. And that point is typically reflected uh, with a ventilation spike. Uh, and if you look at the certified bodies out there, ACE was the first organization to move to uh, a different method of, of establishing um, heart rate training zones based on ventilation. Um, I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, but typically, that's why people started using mass testing. 
Um, and then P the other measurement are field tests. And I'm going to talk about a field test that is done by uh, a professional overseas in France. Um, and I'm going to talk about two specific researchers that I think are meaningful to share with you guys. So the first test I'm going to talk about is the commonly used uh, 220 minus your age to get your heart rate zone. Um, Dr. Haskell and Fox were the individuals that created this uh, metric uh, that they really didn't plan originally intend for this to be used um, and adopted so openly. Um, it gets got, you know, this was actually a quote by Dr. Uh, Haskell uh, in the New York Times in 2001 uh, that this really wasn't supposed to uh, be applied the way it was supposed to be applied. And, and the reason why is because if you see this chart of training zones, statistically, what it shows is that it either under or over trains a group. Um, so 13% of our population um, above or below get over or under trained based on using this algorithm. Um, and then it might fit initially that group that falls into that bell-shaped curve. But what happens is uh, as they start training, right, they're either going to get, because they're going to get fitter, they either fall, they're going to not train at the right intensities and never really progress. Or uh, if they don't get the right training stimulus, then they fall they will actually um, start getting overtraining or undertraining, potentially either or. So are there a is there a better way? And I think an algorithm is not terrible. It's an okay start, but we can do better. Uh, and, and the better is using um, something that might measure ventilation. Um, the fire harness actually will measure uh, uh, through a, a, a string gauge, uh, measure uh, ventilation deflection, flow rate. Uh, so this chart here talks about breathing rate and heart rate. Um, you could also measure that with a gas mask. Uh, the problem with masks are that most people will quit because of discomfort, and it's not always available. Uh, and most importantly, those devices um, have to be at a high clinical grade. My opinion, well, not my opinion. I know you need to calibrate these devices based on a known measurement of gas. So you need to know the exact method, the exact measurement of O2 and CO2, CO2 to this device that tells you what they're consuming uh, as far as during work is accurate. So you can't calibrate these devices without actually having these canisters that tell you exactly what the exact gas measurement is. And if they're claiming that they can calibrate O2 and CO2 by ambient air, um, I would have a bridge I could sell you. Um, so that's my, again, caveat here is my personal opinion. If you guys have uh, a different comment on that, I encourage you to comment on it. Uh, but um, let's get back to the point of, of, of this slide, which is really looking at VT2. If you look at this slide here and you look at ventilation as it slowly increases up, the first increase is called VT1, and the greatest change later in exercise as the intensity starts climbing up during the stages of, inter, uh, of uh, increased intensity, in other words, we start at a specific speed and minute by minute that speed goes up. Later during the exercise, we see this great spike in, in ventilation that's been associated with BT2. Linearly, we see the same type of uh, spike in heart rate, uh, where that spike with ventilation and heart rate is called BT2, and then that's their anaerobic threshold, their heart rate at AT. We know that below that is a fat is how is a more of an aerobic training activity, and above it is more of an anaerobic. And we could now plan our training zones on that. So this is a little bit more dialed in, more fixed, so we can know that exactly what our athletes are doing. Because again, that 220 minus your age, although it's not terrible, it's mathematically just false. It's not a good start. Uh, some type of test. Uh, maybe a mile run, uh, maybe a beep test, uh, and a beep test is something similar to what I'm going to talk about right now. It's an intermittent test uh, over a period of time. Uh, this is typically done, this, this testing protocol for team sports, because if you get two, what I call, um, more bang for your buck in this test. Uh, you get two scores that are relevant in training. Uh, with a red depth test, we get heart rate data. We know their training zones. With a test like this, I can get their critical velocity score along with their uh, anaerobic threshold information. 
So what? Well, why is it important? Is because when I'm training 20 or 30 athletes at the same time, how can I make it one-on-one? -on -one? How can I make, how can I enhance my athletes? And how do I make sure I'm not over and under training the individuals that are not as fit as my physiological studs? Well, what this basically does is that this is a test over 40 meters where over 30 seconds of, uh, of uh, intensity uh, of shuttle speed is applied to this 30 second window by a 15 second passive recovery. Uh, uh, passive recovery uh, is applied right after the 30 seconds of stimulus. And each stage uh, goes up by 0.5 uh, kilometers an hour. You start off at 8.5 kilometers an hour. The individual finishes once they can't get to the next stage. Well, what does this establish? This establishes a, a critical velocity score. And critical velocity is basically that point uh, where that speed uh, that we see can't be maintained any longer. Um, and that point for me is a training number that I could establish now, I could implement in a group. And how, why is this uh, critical velocity score important? It's kind of like when I take a 1RM bench test or a 1RM squat test, I take a percentage of my 1RM because I want a specific muscle fiber response. Uh, so when I look at speed training or I look at training in a group, I'm also looking at how I, I could impact their muscular uh, along with energy systems. And this test has actually been, actually been uh, associated with improving uh, performance testing. So performance testing is really important. If I'm going to do a test that actually enhances performance testing, then I know it's a meaningful test to apply. Um, you could do a beep test. It's been historically done also with a beep test, but you just can't get critical velocity. Um, there are different types of tests, uh, but for this presentation, we're going to talk about 30 to 15. And if you're going to do a test, this actually has been associated positively at improving uh, 10 meter runs, kind of movement jump, heart rate recovery. Uh, it's actually been also uh, associated with VO2 max. So if I could enhance all those different types of metrics in a group, that's going to be great. And why do I do this? Is I made mention to this before. We have different athletes in our team, right? Because we have different positions, and different positions have different types of metabolic demands, so metabolic fingerprint, if you may. So we have that aerobic profile player, we have that mixed profile player, and then we have that anaerobic profile player. Uh, so we know that they all have a specific profile that they, they need to fit. So if I just apply, uh, for example, everyone needs to do 1040s, um, that 40-yard test is not going to exactly be, um, you're going to see one player finish really well and not be challenged. One player um, finish and uh, just barely, barely struggle. Uh, and then I have an athlete that um, it can't finish in time. So what I'm going to do is just bring up this slide here and just show you to the, the left here, we see three different heart rate curves. One that actually... Uh, and the athlete actually increased and got into acidosis faster than the other group, one that had a steady response like a desired, and then one that really wasn't challenged. But if we actually had had them cover in that period of time, based on their critical velocity, that group A has to finish during this time over 100 meters, and then we have um, a group B that has to do 80 meters, and then group C that has to do 60 meters over this period of time, then we know what exactly uh, the positive training stimulus, right, which is represented here in this curve here. So we see that that dose was an optimal dose in training them. So um, what we have here is I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, my uh, my podcast here. I have three coaches that I did a podcast with that I really think is important to share here. And if you haven't heard them, you should hear them because this presentation is kind of a summary of how they apply uh, technology and heart rate training and metabolic training. Um, Coach West at UConn talked about how he used the 3015 protocol with the basketball program and with the soccer program uh, up at UConn. Um, he also talked about using training load um, or heart rate as a training load um, in their practice and play to make sure that their athletes are prepared and ready for bouts of exercise. 
uh, and we're going to actually share a longitudinal study that they actually did up at UConn um, over a four-year period that correlated with them winning, um, I believe, two championships. Uh, and then we have Coach uh, Taylor, who actually structured his workouts according uh, – he had uh, – he was challenged with space compared to other coaches. They have uh, big, big uh, training areas. He trained at, um, he was a coach at Loyola, Loyola University, working with his lacrosse, uh, men's and women's, and the soccer men's and women's program, and the basketball men's and women's program. So he had very little equipment. So how do you train these athletes? He was really smart by actually using, um, he measured every single activity. So if he knew he had to get X amount of training points, he knew what activity to apply for them to make sure that the bench player was ready to play if they needed to, as well as the athlete that is getting so much dosage. He knows how to balance that out. And then Coach Everton, the coach at Everton, Steve Tanjian, um uses other technology that measures mechanical load with heart rate. Um, he, used G, he used GPS technology along with accelerometer technology to measure the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. These three podcasts, are, I encourage you guys, if you haven't listened to them, please go ahead and listen to them because it, it kind of really adds to what I'm talking to you about now. So that's my, sh my shameless plug. Um, so what I'm going to next talk about is what are some other indicators for metabolic training? Can we, besides doing a ramped effort test, do something else that could measure my athlete's activity for uh, preparedness or readiness? So... Uh, heart rate variability has been studied over and over again. So if you look at that QRS waveform and we look at the space and distance and time between each beat per minute, that's a reflection of, your, of how stressed your body is. So you could use something like this, and I've been recently posting all my week-to-week um, -week activities towards my Tough Mudder run. Um, so um, I'm going to be doing a Tough Mudder, uh, and uh, I'm using this device in every morning and then before and after my workouts to indicate to me the types of stress and load. So it's represented here along with the other data that I'm getting is the opt if, I'm, if I can go uh, hard to train in, if I can train in these zones here, you see that it indicates it gives me the green light to train in those training zones, and then it gives me a red light to train not in that training zone. Um, so it's great information. While I'm not guessing, I'm using biomarkers to know besides with me knowing how my body works. Um, technology really could help me give me a better idea of when I should actually train hard. Um, so, you know, there's my one thing that, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to push any product specifically, but what I'm trying to encourage everyone that's listening to this is to use some type of feedback, even if it's just something as simple as a heart rate monitor, um, something as simple as a uh, pulse oximeter, um, but something that gives you feedback. So something that I used to always hear as a personal trainer is, is there a fat burning zone? And typically I ask them, you know, I start with what's their fitness goal? Well, weight loss. Well, you know, the misnomer is if I train at lower intensities where I know if I'm predominantly still using fat, I'm going to burn, um, I'm going to burn the most amount of fat in my workouts. Therefore, I'm going to have positive weight loss. That's not exactly true. Uh, we know that you burn more fat um, right now, what I'm doing, at rest, right? Um, so how do I impact this positively? What is really a better way to train for weight loss? And why do I train with different uh, training zones? So usually I have a conversation with my client or my athlete. I'm talking about um, this ratio uh, of equivalence of energy. Um, this one, uh, one point here that you see, 1.0 at the bottom, where 100% is coming, uh, my energy is coming from carbohydrates, very little from fat. That's usually, if I look at a heart rate curve, is in my red zone, really hard intensity, fast twitch muscle fiber. Um, I know that I'm burning a lot of energy if I'm that close to that RER. If I'm below, I'm typically burning a lot more fat, really, you know, efficiently using an energy source with very low intensity. So as long as we have that understanding, we know exactly how the body works, right? Remember that track and field slide where we talked about different events, different muscle fibers, different types of energy sources being used? Um, there was a study, and, and, and this study's been replicated many by many different coaches. 
Uh, Coach Boyle did this on a bike with a couple of his athletes just to communicate a message. Um, he actually posted it on his Strength Coach podcast and his Strength Coach blog. Um, I, I actually want to give credit here to two people before I forget. One is the Coach Moxley, um, uh, exercise physiology professor down in Urbana University for the track and field uh, slide. Um, was a presentation that I heard from him. And second to um, Coach uh, Robbins, um, who used to work for Athletes Performance, now works for Stats, uh, talked about training with anaerobic thresholds. And this is really the message here that I'm, uh, I'm going to try to convey to you guys here. There, this study basically took an individual that 30, did 30 minutes of biking, and, uh, and we assigned to uh, basically two, uh, three different groups. Um, so three different, one experiment and two different control groups. Uh, one control group basically did low intensity zone one, 65% of their max heart rate, predominantly fat burning. This group, uh, same individual, excuse me, did uh, three different types of stimulus. So it was the same individual. Um, so I apologize. There's no control or experiment here. I apologize for that. Um, so we, we noticed the output was 82 calories, 41 from fat. Um, great for base building. This is actually great for recovery. So if you have an athlete that is overstressed with their HRV number, um, this could be done. Have them walk on a treadmill. It enhances their metabolic recovery. Uh, the second stimulus here that I want to talk about is 85% of their maximum heart rate, the green level. And here, what we see is that their training zone is a, uh, they expended 157 calories, more calories expended. Kind of a no-brainer here, right? Only 10 from fat. So this is more about learning to use and buffer um, that uh, anaerobic threshold uh, and uh, anaerobic glycolysis uh, as an energy source that um, we could see here uh, is good for um, what you typically see uh, during matches or during steady efforts. And then the third stimulus that I want to point out is what is a commonly applied method now, interval training or HIIT training, where people think that this is great for fat burning. And it's really what I look at this, it's not about the fat burning, but it's about the muscle building that I'm doing here, right? I know that it's a really high intensity, 92% and above of their maximum heart rate. I want to climb them up, really work them hard. Um, sweat, one word answer is basically just maybe a nod. Um, they burn more energy, but they also burn a uh, good amount of fat. But more importantly, they're working more muscles. So we're building more muscle with cardiovascular exercise or sometimes non-traditional movements like circuit training, um, commonly seen by Metcons done in the CrossFit environment. So the reason why I think this training stimulus works is because of that muscle building standpoint. So typically the argument is what's best for fat, fat burning? Um, the caveat being that if they are not uh, fit enough and they don't have good movement skill, we shouldn't have them at this intensity yet, right? We want to have them do their yellow and greens first, building up to hit type of training or muscle building type of training, right? Um, so um, hopefully we can put this fat burning uh, training myth to bed. Uh, encourage you guys to go and share the good word and try to educate them. So um, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, team sports. Uh, and how can we apply technology and give those key performance indicators to sport coaches and to strength and conditioning coaches that, uh, one, um, have probably the most stressful job ever because if they're not winning, they don't have a job. Um, so I, I look at um, sports, coach, uh, sports coaching or um, strength and conditioning coaching as kind of a life of a salesman. Um, if they're not uh, hitting their quotas and not selling and not winning every month, um, they don't ha they're not uh, there for long. So um, I I'm going to start off with uh, a kind of a, the reason why uh, this uh, next study came about. Uh, I was given a book uh, one time, a uh, Bangsville book. Uh, this is just one example of a researcher out there that looked at predictive key performance indicators again, right? Of, of sports and what he noticed was the best athletes not only have the most explosive strength, best speed, or, or the most agile, 
it was really their ability to recover from short and intense exercise bouts. How well could they repeat that elastic quality and that speed and that agility? So um, this study that we're talking about, I've made mention to it before, um, at the University of Connecticut, um, Dr. Silvestre, along with the uh, team sport programs there, uh, and Coach West, um, looked at the practice and the strength and conditioning programs over a four-year period to see what's the optimal uh, dose of intensity that they can manage pre, in, and postseason play. Uh, and what they started noticing was, before they applied this, was let's take a look at what we're training for, right? Um, we're training to play this, you know, uh, Coach Redwards. We train to play, we train to win the game, you know, from uh, at that time he was uh, with the Jets. So um, what Coach West started looking at was looking at his defenders, midfielders, and attackers, and he looked at the total numbers of sprints between what specific distance and the maximal distances that they ran. Um, so uh, these were broken down so he had a better idea of the, uh, the style of play as well as the uh, intensities and demands by player position. So that's just speed and distance. What are some other metrics? Well, here on this graph over a week of 16 weeks, uh, we looked at how many minutes training volume that they train for. So for games, for practices, and their total score. So here we saw uh, their total scores sometimes at the beginning of the season, the first two weeks. They're still coming out of preseason training a lot. You could see that they had a significant amount of training time. Uh, we also saw uh, intensity here sharply go up. And these are point scores. And these point scores are actually based on what uh, a scoring system developed in the 70s, yes, the 1970s, um, still hasn't really, uh, it still hasn't really been fully adopted here in the States. It's been more adopted overseas, uh, but it's a metric that's consistently used now. I'll probably say more um, greatly been applied in our environment here. Uh, it, it's a, called a trim scoring system developed by Dr. Bannister, where we look at time spent in specific zones and they are weighed to a specific coefficient. That coefficient gives us a point score. So what we started looking at was how many points per minute that were they expending in uh, these weeks. Uh, and then this uh, point score became an exertion score. So uh, we looked at averages and then we looked at significant standard deviations. So this exertion score, uh, before I move to American football here, this exertion score, what he noticed, when they concluded something, it found something really, really significant here was um, during their first season, they lost uh, a couple of players due to injury and wanted to know why were they injured or, and, and more importantly, uh, and Coach West mentions this in his blog, his uh, sport coach came down on him and said, players are not running fast enough, their legs are heavy and dead. Coach West are not fit. Uh, and, you know, for the strength and conditioning coach sharing this, they're like, oh, God, I hear this all the time. Uh, well, it's because these athletes were at 1,700 points. I don't know if you look back there in that slide. There was some there were some point systems for uh, 2,500, 2,000 points. Those were significant deviations above. On average, they were expending 1,500 points. Some players already had 1,700 points more than their other teammates. So they basically already played, in some cases, three or four matches more than their teammates. And then it coincided with injuries. So they started asking better questions. Do we know, can we use this system to identify when I need to make sure this athlete's training or not training hard enough? And he uses this still. I encourage you guys to reach out to Coach West. Trip scoring system has been applied in many different environments. Um, I'm sharing one example, and then I'm going to share this example with you and, and talk about how it's applied now in American football. So just the same, we looked at the characteristics of the nature of college football. Um, we looked at the demands of the college football, how many uh, plays, how much stoppage time, and how long were those plays. Uh, and we looked specifically at during summer conditioning um, because we wanted to see was this is where a lot of time is spent to make sure we make champions. 
uh, and that they're ready for preseason and season. So what we what we saw here is when we created these agility or these uh, sprint training protocols for our athletes, we noticed that they did very little time they did very little time recovering, and we started noticing that they were always uh, training at higher intensities, and we started noticing that as the session uh, progressed, they never got faster; they got typically slower. And, and you know, if this is supposed to be agility and sprint training for speed, we know that we should be giving them more rest time. Instead of drilling, 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 drilling to the next exercise progression, uh, this kind of educated them to make sure that, A, we have athletes that might need a little bit more rest. B, we have athletes that might need to be trained a little bit harder. Uh, so those are two important variables to have, but without data, you won't know if you're, what your successes are and what your errors are. Uh, this was another application where they started doing intermittent um, explosive speed work stations, uh, and, and these stations uh, were uh, supposed to be high at, high in lactate lack training, and um, we wanted to see uh, more um, uh, turnover in this case. But what happened was we thought we were applying a fast two. Uh, type B type of muscle training, um, and we started noticing that if we look at their heart rates and we look at that they're not recovering fast enough, we would like to see actually these curves, these peaks uh, and valleys look more like a sinusoidal waveform where we see that drop coming back down into that blue zone. That's when we can dose them again. And every time that we see this curve not come down, we should actually stop because there's no more training benefit there. So um, we didn't know any better until we, again, had data to make a better educated decision. Last but not least, um, this is something that I, I, when I recorded it, I was able to talk to the sport coaches and say, is this uh, testing protocol um, about performance or about just a gut check? And I understand sometimes you've got to have a test to test um, and to make sure your athletes are ready. Um, to work, you know, pack that lunchbox, we're going to go to work. Uh, and that's kind of this test protocol here. It's 18 to 110 yard runs, typically done in a football environment. And um, what we see here is a lineman score where if we look at it, I marked it. Um, these are 14, he never finished. Uh, and you see that he's dragging. He's just dragging, never dropped down to the blue zone never was able to finish um, his training intensity. So if we look at this, is this really getting him ready for preseason? Is this really meaningful um, for a typical football, especially a lineman? Most linemen are never going to cover 100, 110 yards in a match. Uh, so it was great education, great information to have, again, data to have and make, uh, to, to drive a decision. So... To put this in better, to frame this a little bit better, um, here are two soccer players to see the individual difference by player position. One offensive player had a higher training load, was spending more time at specific higher intensities, and they needed more recovery time reflected by that shadow after that bar graph. Now, the defender here was ready to go the next day if I had to actually train him. So as a coach, I have to either make, make sure I dose my, my defenders maybe the same day a little bit more so he might get some extra training or the next day he might be doing a specific different training intensity compared to my offensive player. So again, having training indicators, key performance indicators, biomarkers for preparedness and readiness for my athletes will help them progress. Now, I will tell you that this can apply to an average Joe just like me. I'm posting week by week my training loads. I'm using my Omega Wave uh, ECG sensor to tell me exactly if I'm ready to have a hard workout. Um, this is actually one of the posts that I've had. Uh, I, put, I, I posted recently talking about training time in regards to training zone. If you look at it, my heavy day was 38 minutes, only eight minutes more than my other days. But if you look at uh, uh, 211 points of training load compared to any other day. So um, I had my heavy day at the beginning of the week this week. Um, normally, either it's Wednesday or Mondays for me, but I had a great HRV score. Uh, I hit the hammer, uh, and I steadily 
decline that intensity. Uh, here's exactly uh, a simple way of looking at my training intensity over a period of time. Uh, so my point in summary here is that you could use uh, a heart rate monitor, you could use an accelerometer um, to identify key performance indicators. Uh, fitness testing, getting a maximal heart rate score. Um, is this really meaningful training for uh, my seasons? Am I providing suitable recovery for my players? Um, some unintended consequences was um, I start, it's, it could be used as an educational tool for the sport coach. Uh, maybe explaining to them that they might uh, need to curb certain approaches or uh, be aware that certain players will decondition if they don't get the proper training stimulus. So uh, here's some of my work that I'm citing. Uh, I encourage you guys to go to uh, peakperformanceradio.net. Uh, there's my email. There's my phone number. Um, please uh, give me you know, your feedback. Uh, I enjoy doing this. Um, I will actually keep updating you week by week uh, towards my journey for uh, my, pot, my uh, first Tough Mudder. Uh, and uh, we will be doing our next podcast within a week. So I encourage you guys, again, to give me your feedback. I enjoyed this. Have a great day.